Hello and welcome back to Biology 206. My name is Dr. Jennifer Baltzer and today we're going to be continuing our conversation about communities and specifically we're going to be focusing on change in communities and so through the lecture we're going to hear about um, different successional processes, uh, different models of succession, how these play out in real world scenarios, um, and and thinking about how you know how these communities that we've learned about may vary through time in response to a range of disturbances. For example, this um, beautiful picture of Mount St. Helens, uh, the, the eruption of Mount St. Helens in the early 80s, um, which leads to what we'll learn about in a little bit, um, primary successional processes where, where a new earth material is laid down um, and, and everything is destroyed and the whole system has to start, um, start anew. So we're gonna be hearing about um, various disturbances like we see here uh, and, and talking about what the implications of that are for, uh, for, for the community and for the um, uh, recovery of the community. Okay, so succession, the definition of it, is a change in species composition of communities over time. And we know that communities change with time, and this can be in response to a wide range of factors. Um, we'll get into those factors, but a, a great example of the, the different ways even a, a similar system can change through time is from this example of Mount St. Helens. So here's a map of the impact of the eruption on the surrounding forested landscape. Um, and you can see that, you know, this, this brown area was the actual pumice plain, which you can see depicted here. This is new, um, new earth material, lava coming up and cooling on the surface and creating new, new earth material. There was a large um, debris avalanche that destroyed everything. You can see a, a picture of this here, basically scoured the entire surface, removing all vegetation, killing anything in its path. And so these areas are, are areas that, that really started afresh. Um, and any kind of um, recovery of those requires a, you know, a reinitiation of, of everything from kind of soil formation to, um, to colonization. And so, so these are great examples of what we'll learn about, which are primary areas that would undergo primary succession. Now, in contrast, there was this much larger area that had really severe impacts of the eruption. Of course, it's incredibly hot temperatures. Uh, the, the power with which you, volcanoes erupt is really incredible, leading to this huge area of blowdown, all of this white area was, was blowdown area where the trees were just knocked over by the force of the eruption. Um, and, and so of course, all of the trees were killed, but all of the, the tree bodies, the, the, the dead stems were left, you know, all of the organic material in that system was left. And the same holds true for this orange area, which is the scorch zone, uh, where, where dead trees were left standing but were, were killed because of the heat from the eruption. And so, so these areas have a lot of remaining biological material to um, support much more rapid recovery. And so when we think about that, we think about something we refer to as secondary succession. And we've heard a little bit about that in the context of, of wildfire already. So Succession, all of these are different, you know, all of these different areas um, that were impacted by the eruption will, will um, change through time. Colonizers will come in, um, the, the, the community uh, in, in those areas will change, but they'll take different tra trajectories depending on the, the disturbance itself. Okay, so change in species composition of communities over time. And as you will have inferred, the drivers of successional processes are, are disturbance events. Um, and so a disturbance is an abiotic event that physically injures or kills some individuals and creates opportunities for other individuals to grow or reproduce. And this, this definition of disturbance is really broad and can incorporate a lot of different factors. Here's a table from your text. You know, here's a range of abiotic factors that are considered to be disturbances. Um, and when we think of disturbances, we often think of these really catastrophic 
catastrophic disturbances like volcanoes, like wildfires, um, hurricanes and tornadoes. But, but in fact, depending on the organism in question, depending on um, the, eco, or the, the community in question, disturbances can be much, much more nuanced. We'll learn about um, an example where, you know, wave action just turns over rocks and so and and creates um, basically disturbs those those, um, you know, turn turns over rocks that are inhabited by algae and in doing so kills that algae and algae has to colonize a new on the on the new surface of the rock. So something as really innocuous as wave action can for certain organisms be a major disturbance in and of itself. Um, uh, so a whole range of abiotic factors that can lead to uh, disturbance in the system. And, and we can also think of disturbance in the context of uh, stress, which is the reduction of growth, reproduction, or survival of individuals by an abiotic factor. And so if we think about, for example, drought, uh, so we have here water supply. If we think about drought, we don't often, you know, we certainly heard of, you know, last summer with the heat dome coming through in Western Canada, uh, that there were, you know, really severe drought impacts that, that would be considered a pretty severe disturbance. But in many cases, drought is much, much more subtle. Some individuals are killed, other individuals, their, their, their growth and reproduction is reduced. Um, you know, but it's not, it's not kind of a reset of the system like some of these more extreme disturbances we have there. But it can still be, it can still create small scale disturbances in the system. And um, so, so in the context of succession, stress can lead to community compositional changes as well. And so is a form of disturbance that, that alters the trajectory of that community. And finally, biotic disturbances. So interactions where at least one species is negatively impacted, thereby leading to community change. And we have these various negative interactions that we learned about in the last few lectures. So competition, predation, herbivory, disease. You know, there's, there's any number of biotic factors that can negatively impact certain parts of the community and alter the trajectory of that community. Okay, and then so, so we have biotic disturbances, we have abiotic disturbances, all of these things can lead, can modify the path of succession, can, mod, can result in community compositional changes through time. And when we think about succession, not all succession is the same. Not all successional processes are the same because not all disturbances are the same as we just heard about. So the nature of succession depends on the intensity and frequency of disturbance. So the intensity is really how severe that disturbance is. You know, how much of the system is wiped out by the disturbance. We can think on the one end of, you know, a, a, a moderate or mild, a very mild drought where some really drought sensitive species may be um, killed or, may, or their growth may be reduced. On the other hand, on the other, on the other end, we can have, you know, um, a volcanic eruption like we saw in, um, in the context of uh, the first slides where it's an incredibly intense, um, severe disturbance where everything is lost from the system. So we have this spectrum of intensity of disturbance from low to high, and we also have this component of frequency. So how often does the disturbance happen? And this, is also, this also can be very, you know, you can range from very infrequent to very frequent. And one thing you'll notice, and this little bubble highlights this, we don't have any, you know, we can't have communities forming in this area where we have both high intensity, so really severe disturbances, as well as high frequency. It's simply, too, that would simply be too much disturbance to allow, um, to allow for colonization and any successional processes to occur. So this, this is kind of a, a space and a, a portion of disturbance space that we just can't occupy with, with communities. But everything from um, here downward we can. And so, you know, in the most, the, the most extreme disturbances, so things like um, volcanic eruptions, things like, um, you know, glacial, 
uh, glacial processes. These are really low frequency but really high intensity and they knock the whole system back to a starting point. Everything is, you know, all, all living things are lost from that system. Um, in some cases you're down to bare earth material, to bare rock, and even, even the process of soil formation has to reinitiate. And so these are the situations where we have primary successional processes, okay? Um, then we have situations where you have kind of a moderate intensity of disturbance and it's a moderate frequency, okay? So it, it happens more frequently than these really high severity, uh, high intensity disturbances, but it doesn't happen so often that the, the system doesn't have a chance to recover. And so these are what we think of as secondary successional processes. And a great example of that is wildfire. You know, typically in Canada's a boreal, boreal um, country, typically in boreal forests we'll have a fire return interval or the, the frequency of fire will be every, you know, every 100 years, every 150 years or so. Okay, so not too often the community has a chance to reestablish itself and come to some, you know, um, reasonable level of maturity before a disturbance hits again. Um, so these are these are secondary successional processes. And then then we have these, you know, really low low level disturbances where um, they're they're low frequency or even sometimes high frequency, but because the disturbance is so uh, the the intensity of the disturbance is so low it really leads to very little successional change. So we might think about that, you know, a, a fairly high frequency but low intensity disturbance might be something like, um, uh, tree, if you think about an entire forest, tree mortality events and, and gap openings, uh, or that might be kind of moderate, uh, moderate level of frequency where, you know, a single tree, a single individual tree dies this opens up a canopy opening and allows for other species to to recruit underneath it. Um, it's not a very you know it doesn't you would never look at that system and say oh that forest has been changed to something really quite different. The forest will look effectively the same, but you have these small scale, low intensity disturbances happening, um, you know, at moderate to to high frequencies. Okay, and so so very little in the way of successional change, but these these low intensity low or high frequency um, disturbance events can be really important for maintaining biodiversity in, in, in many systems. Okay, so we've got different types of successional change that are associated with the nature of the disturbance, both the intensity and the frequency. Okay, so moving on to, to define these terms. So we talked already a little bit about primary succession, about secondary succession. Well, what are these? Primary succession is the colonization of habitats that are devoid of life, either because of catastrophic disturbance or newly created habitat. So again, if we go back to that example um, of, of volcanic activity, we have both you know, both catastrophic disturbance in that in that debris flow that just took everything out, as well as newly created, um, uh, well, catastrophic disturbance both in the way of, of the debris flow and the the, the lava flow itself. Um, in terms of newly created habitat, these are places that, you know, if you think about a deltaic area, for example, a river delta where you have um, stream channels moving around and sediment being deposited in different places. That deposition of sediment into um, small pockets can, can support plant establishment. Those are newly created habitats, okay? Um, so you can, you can think of any number of, of situations where, where new sediment is deposited um, and provides an opportunity for colonization and establishment in those areas, all right? Another another great example would be, you know, the creation of um, um, where where we have you know reefs that end up being up above the surface of uh, the surface of the ocean and creating new um, new island habitat. Uh, that's another example where you have newly created habitats that were not previously there before. Okay. 
Secondary succession is the re-establishment of a community in which most but not all of the organisms have been destroyed. So again, these are you know situations like we saw in the eruption where you had blowdown, where you had um, scorching. Uh, wildfires are another great example. You can think of um, most you know kind of most avalanche situations. Uh, you may have some remaining material, but you'll have lots of um, lots of individuals that have been lost. Uh, these are the kinds of uh, processes that lead to secondary succession. Okay, so you've still got some of the organic material from the original system there. You've still got, you know, typically you'll still have soils, maybe you'll still have some seed bank, uh, maybe you'll still have some dead standing or maybe even live standing individuals. Um, but it has mostly been wiped out but not to the same extent as primary succession where you're really starting on, you know, basically on bare rock. Okay, so we have this nice little chart from your, uh, from your text where here we have this situation where we're really starting afresh so we have no life. So maybe that's that, that pumice, that, that new, newly formed where the lava flow was um, from the volcano. Maybe it's a glacier that's retreatable. We'll hear about glaciers and, um, and their retreat and what that looks like. But both of those are great examples of primary succession. So you start with just bare, bare rock, bare, um, bare new sediment. And so you've got no life. Then this is the primary successional pathway. So you have some pioneer stage that comes in initially. And we'll talk about the role that those pioneers play um, in successional processes. Um, those pioneers often modify the environment in a way that uh, other species may be able to come in and take advantage of that um, modified environment, uh, leading to some intermediate stage. So um, if we think about, you know, glacial retreat or, you know, new bare rock, a lot of times that early, that very first pioneer stage is lichens, which come in and they're able to digest the rock a little bit and create just a little bit of humus there that maybe then some mosses come, can come in and take hold and begin to start to create um, uh, organic material that will form a soil substrate for other plants to grow on, as an example. So this is really the, the pioneer stage. And oftentimes these species, we, we learned about pioneer species, oftentimes these species are really um, quite stress tolerant and have special adaptations to these uh, newly disturbed environments. Okay. Um, so, this can lead to an intermediate stage, and then you know, then that proceeds through. You continue to have further establishment of, of kind of later successional species, which leads to what this this graph refers to as a climax stage. Now, arguably, lots of people do not consider there to be you know do not consider climax stage to be an appropriate term, and a lot of people would refer to that as you know a mature stage. Or, or something akin, and we'll learn about why that's the case. There's not necessarily a single end point of most ecosystems. This is sort of an artifact of early successional studies where, where early ecologists really viewed um, ecosystems as quite, uh, communities as quite static, that they had a single static endpoint that successional processes took them toward. We know now that that's not the case, but this this climax stage terminology has, has really, um, been maintained, uh, been maintained in ecology. Okay, so you you know if you have no other disturbance, you go from no life to the pioneer stage to some intermediate stage uh, to a mature or climax stage. Okay, but disturbances can happen anywhere along the way, um, and depending on how severe that disturbance is, any of these three, um, you know. stages can be set back to a no life stage if you have some some new catastrophic disturbance event that clears everything away again you can go back to this no life stage uh, but you can also have a, a, you know a, 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 a less severe uh, a less intense disturbance happens 
happen that takes you to this point of some life, okay? And so this is where we have a, a, a large disturbance, but it's not as intense as something that would take us back to no life. So there's some life remaining following the disturbance, and this is where these secondary successional processes happen. So in this case, we, we skip this pioneer stage. We go straight from some life to some, some intermediate stage, okay? So this is sort of the secondary successional uh, cycle, if you will, whereas this is the primary successional cycle where, if it, it, again, if you have a catastrophic event, it takes us right back to this. Okay, and these arrows just represent different agents of change. These can be um, disturbance events, stress events, and you can see that they all go in the opposite direction of the successional processes. So these big black arrows represent succession, they represent you know, colonization processes, population, um, population expansion, you know, dispersal into, into broader areas. Uh, this is you know, the, the accumulation of species. That's what these large uh, outlined arrows indicate. The smaller green arrows that go in the opposite direction those indicate agents of disturbance, so stress, um, or agents of change, so disturbance, stress, negative biotic interactions, etc. Okay. So th these are this is basically what happens with succession, and so it's really important for you to understand the difference between primary succession and secondary succession and what that looks like. Okay. You probably cannot see most of what's on here. I'm not too concerned about this, but I just wanted to flag this uh, table from your text um, because in addition to um, sort of primary succession, secondary succession, we also think about, okay, well, in these successional pathways, what are the processes at play? And a number of different models were proposed by a team of scientists, uh, Joseph Connell and Slater, uh, who, who proposed three different models of um, succession. One is a facilitation model, the second is a tolerance model, and the third is an inhibition model. So we have these three different models. And I'm just gonna walk you through each of those in the, sub, in the next slides with some examples of where we might see those different models of succession playing out. And then we'll take a look at some real world examples of successional processes. And um, I guess what I wanna flag is that in a lot of cases, we see some mixture of these different models of succession, all acting, all at work in you know, a single successional sequence, okay? so. We'll start with facilitation, we'll go to inhibition and then tolerance, and then we'll take a look at these in the context of some other examples. All right, so facilitation um, is the situation where a pioneer species, where pioneer species establish themselves um, at the beginning of the succession process. And so we saw that in that table, we have these pioneer species that come in. Now that's always the case in succession, you have some, some early, early species that come in. In the case of facilitation, it's exactly, you know, we've already learned about facilitation, it's exactly what the title would suggest. Those early successional species, those pioneer species, actually help to ameliorate the, the system and make it, kind of prime it for other species to come in, okay? So those early colonists alter conditions or resource availability, making it possible for subsequent species to colonize and survive. And so a great example of this, this comes from your textbook. This is some work, some early work by um, Henry Coles, who was an early, uh, uh, an early ecologist. And this is work from way back in the late 1800s. Uh, and he was working in these dune environments. And so this is a, you know, very, if any of you who have explored sand dunes, you know that these are really unstable environments. You've got wave action, you've got wind action, you've got sand that's scouring your plant tissues. And so what he, what he did was he was really interested in this progression of vegetation from you know, the edge of 
the edge of the dune backwards, and he used what's referred to as a as a space for time approach, where he assumed that as you were walking backwards along this dune, that you were experiencing an older community, which makes a lot of sense, right? Um, and we often use these space for time approaches um, in ecology because it's it's really hard when you're working in ecosystems to wait for them to go from, you know their reset, so say after a fire, all the way to some climax or mature stage, right? As a forest ecologist, that's going to take at least, you know, at least 100 years. Um, I'm, that's, that's, I'm not going to do that, right? I can't do that. And so we, we sample across different ages of um, within the landscape and look at the communities in those different aged um, parts of the landscape, in this case, Walking back in time, walking back from from these um, sort of establishing parts of the dune to uh, more better established parts of the dune in forests, you know, I would I would age the stand and and sample across a range of ages. There are lots of problems associated with that approach, um, because you know, in in some cases, like in the case of the sand dune, we don't know for sure that these are older than than. You know that that we that that the system is older way back here compared to here. For example, in the case of you know the the forest chrono sequence, the forest space for time example I gave, you know there's lots of environmental variation that can confound um, that that can confound the, any response you see to kind of time after disturbance. So, but in this case. He used this space for time approach to evaluate the, these dune communities. And one of the things, um, I guess this, this facilitation piece that I wanted to highlight is the fact that there's, you know, the very first, or the, the colonists that you have, or the species that you have down here, right at the kind of, at the edge of the dune vegetation community um, is this American beach grass. And what this American beach grass does is it helps to, you know, it's very resistant to wind and water um, stresses. Uh, and what it helps to do is capture uh, sand and help build, you can even see this kind of hummocky uh, formation here. It can help build little, a little bit of topography in there. And so then other plants can establish themselves um, establish themselves kind of on the leeward side of these these little grass these little grass mounds that accumulated some sand and that protects those um, later successional species or those um, those species that aren't the this early pioneer species from you know sand scouring from wind from wave action and helps them to establish in ways that they wouldn't be able to if those grasses weren't there so this, this American beach grass really helps to, um, uh, helps to facilitate the establishment of other species by protecting them from some of these stressors, okay? So, um, initial colonists are ultimately replaced because the conditions they have themselves created favor other species. And so you can imagine this situation where you've got these really light demanding grasses, they create habitat that other um, species are able to grow in and maybe those other species overtop the grasses and we can see that we can see that here maybe you end up with some low shrubs that are able to outcompete those grasses for light or for other resources um, so in a in the facilitation model you have these early pioneer species that that in a way in a way almost act altruistically you know they establish themselves and then um, other species are able to make use of this modified environment. And so from a diversity perspective, again, having these disturbances is really important because those early colonizers need that disturbance in order to be able to maintain a population. Because once the later successional species come in, then we lose that early successional species from the system. Okay, um, inhibition is a situation where early colonizers, so again, the early colonizers are modifying the environment but they're modifying the environment in ways that benefit them and harm others. Okay, so in this model, whoever gets into the system first can modify the environment to ensure their own success, all right? 
Now you, you may be wondering, well, how does that happen? And so it may occur because of competition. So if you just have to be the first one in post disturbance and you're able to grow and outcompete others, then you can stop them from, from doing well and you can facilitate your own success. Or allelopathy, and allelopathy is where uh, is basically chemical warfare in, um, in plants. And so a couple of great examples of, of this is um, these birch shrubs in Scandinavia, in, in boreal Scandinavia, which can uh, release allelopathic compounds into the soil, which impact the mycorrhizal, the establishment of mycorrhizal associations of, of other plants. And um, in that way, they, they reduce the, um, they have a negative impact on the other species and um, this may allow them to, to have a competitive edge and do better in that system than, than other species that might come in. Another great example of allelopathy is uh, a species that we have here, so black walnut. Um, for any of you who have, you know, if, if you have a black walnut in your backyard or if, you're, if your parents do or your grandparents, probably you will have noticed that nothing, nothing it's really hard to grow things around black walnut. And so, um, again, black walnut exudes juglone, which is a chemical, um, the scientific name, the, um, uh, the genus name for, for uh, walnut is juglans. Uh, and so juglone is named after that. So juglone is, a, is an allelopathic chemical that is produced by walnut and Im impedes the growth of, others, of other um, species around it. So it's released from roots, it's, ex it's exuded from roots, it's released from decomposing roots, it's released from decomposing leaves and fruits and twigs, and any, again, anyone who has a walnut in their yard, you know that there's tons of this fruit that comes down. And so there's juglone in all of those plant parts that basically act to keep an area clear around the individual, thereby ensuring that it has access to all the resources, it does not have to compete for resources. Okay, so this is what we're talking about in terms of inhibition. The net effects of that species resist invasion by potential competitors, so they actually actively exclude other species, and um, we only see the replacement of those early species when they die, okay? So until that species has died and is no longer actively kind of defending its territory, so to speak, um, you, you won't see their replacement. And so this is a very different successional model. Finally, we have the model of tolerance. So just like we saw in the inhibition model, it's a situation where you don't necessarily need a pioneer species coming in. It can, any species can establish itself um, under the prevailing conditions. But unlike either facilitation or inhibition models, the modification, any modifications that early colonizers make to the environment have little, little net effect on other species that may come into the system. And basically the outcome of this successional process is de determined by competition for diminishing resources. Okay, so when we think a great example of this is, you know, old abandoned agricultural fields where you've got all kinds of grasses and forbs and um, different herbaceous species. Uh, and, then, and then we start to see woody plants establishing themselves. If those woody plants are able to deal with the competition that those other um, herbaceous plants provide, if they're able to deal with uh, you know, reduced light under the canopy of this herbaceous layer until they're able to overtop it, then they will be able to um, proceed through this successional sequence. And so it, in this example, we see these you know, pine trees popping their heads out above um, above these uh, grasses in this particular field. Um, and eventually that those, those um, uh, pines will, you know, become similar to the forest in behind uh, and create, convert this old abandoned agricultural field to a wooded environment, okay? But it really is, you know, it's not a, a well-organized sequence of species A, species B, species C, but rather whoever is able to establish themselves and deal with the competitive environment that is there, um, and if, if they're then able to um, grow up and out of that, then they'll be able to um, they will be able to contribute to that successional sequence. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you three examples from your text 
Uh, the first example is primary succession in Glacier Bay in Alaska. Um, so here we have the Gulf of Alaska and um, what this map is showing us is the historic retreat of the glaciers. And so way back in the late 1700s, this early explorer, Captain Vancouver, uh, visited Glacier Bay in 1974 or 1794, sorry, and the glacial ice extended all the way to the mouth here, or the mouth of Glacier Bay here. Okay, that's the that's the name, I guess. And various other explorers after him um, were, you know, found the retreat of uh, of this glacial ice. And then, you know, here we have John Muir who visited in 1879 and the glacial ice only extended to, um, to here. And here's in 1994 where the glacial ice extended to. So you can see this retreat of glacial ice that has, that has really extended quite far um, away from its original starting point. And this picture is just of the, the tongue of the glacier um, extending out and you can see, you know, ice you know, ice calving off of that, of that glacial tongue. Okay, so glaciers, we know they have a pretty big impact on systems. You have this mass of ice just that has, you know, in many cases kind of moved across the landscape and pushed across the landscape as part of an ice sheet, has sat there and compressed the, um, the system underneath it for some long, long period of time. You know, this glacier would have been here since the last ice age. So these glaciers are very, very old. So when we hear about the rapid loss of glacier, glaciers in response to climate change, it is really something to be alarmed about. Those glaciers have been here for such a long time and our, our you know, rapid climate warming, man-made climate warming is really driving this incredibly rapid retreat of um, of these glaciers. Okay, so glaciers are a really cool place though to study primary successional processes. As the glacial ice retreats, you have bare exposed um, um, substrate that has no life, totally devoid of life, right? It's been underneath the ice for some extended period of time. And so when we have these kinds of maps where we know when glacier retreat occurred, then we can look at vegetation assemblages again using a space for time approach to evaluate where different, um, at what point in succession, different ages of, oops, different ages of sites are. So here we have spruce down here in this area that was under ice in 1794, but um, you know by the 18 by 1825 it was no longer under ice. So this this area has been exposed for oh gosh um, you know more than 200 years, whereas here in this area that's been exposed for only about 70 years we've got alder and dryas. So dryas being a really small um, um, forb that, that is, is an early colonizer and a nitrogen fixer, as is alder. Okay, and here we have pioneer species, so just the, the early um, lichens and mosses, okay? And so you can see this space for time approach across this map, all right? So this is how, this is how some of these successional processes are studied in response to glacier retreat. We have this documented history of where glaciers were at different points in time. So we know the age of those areas and then we can associate those plant communities with, with the time since retreat of the glacier. Okay, so changes through time. We have um, basically, so what this graph is showing us is the number of species on the y-axis, so from zero to 50. Remember these are, these are boreal systems, they're montane alpine systems. Um, fairly low diversity, fairly low richness. And then, then we have two pieces of information here. Here's tenure, or this, the, the number indicates the number of years since um, glacial retreat. And so if you recall, we looked at that spruce forest, it had been 200 years, it, it was under ice in 1794. And um, uh, so it had been at least 200 years since, or uh, at, least two, uh, at least 100 years, I guess, since um, it had been under ice. And then we have a spruce hemlock forest that was under ice 200 years ago. 
Alder under ice 44 years ago, dry ice 33, and Pioneer 10 years ago it had um, glacial ice on top of it. All right, and so we can kind of look at these sequences, look at the accumulation of species through time, and this is exactly what we expect with succession. You start it with very few species that are able to colonize, and you end up with a, a, much, a much richer system as, as species arrive, as, as you know, colonization is allowed to occur by, by a wider variety of species. And so early on, we have low shrubs and herbs, mosses, liverworts, and lichens. So blue corresponds to mosses, liverworts, and lichens. Orange corresponds to low shrubs and herbs. And then through time, we add some taller shrubs in the dryas and alder category. So alder being a fairly tall shrub. Um, both dryas and alder are nitrogen fixers. So we have these early pioneers that come in and maybe help to establish some soil. We have dryas and alder, which modify the environment again through their ability to fix nitrogen. Um, and then once we get to the spruce forest, we have kind of the highest, uh, the, the greatest richness. So we have lots of Lots in, the, in these non-vascular community, the mosses, liverworts, and lichens. Um, lots more low shrubs and herbs, um, tall shrubs, and now we have trees, the pink bar being trees, okay? So, change of species richness increases over time as succession proceeds, um, and then they also measured various aspects of the um, abiotic environment. So nitrogen concentration, soil moisture, and soil organic material, how much carbon um, how much organic carbon is in the soil. <laughs> and you can see that through time this, this increases, particularly when you hit the alder stage and then into the spruce stage, we see an increase in nitrogen as alder is added. Again, it's a nitrogen fixer. It has a nitrogen fixing bacteria associated with its roots. Um, and we see this most, most prominent change once we hit the, hit the spruce community where you've got a lot a lot more biomass going into, you know, you've got tr actual trees that are contributing um, biomass and, and materials to, um, in, in much larger quantities than any of the previous, any of the preceding parts, um, sequences in succession had. All right, so this is kind of what this looks like. If you imagine this being the oldest part of, away from the gla um, retreating glacier, and this being the youngest part, so we have the pioneer stage, the driest stage, the alder stage, so these tall green shrubs are alder, and then the spruce stage. And um, Terry Chapin, who's a really, you know, really incredible um, Arctic and boreal ecologist, decided that he would, he would tackle a, an experiment where he planted spruce seedlings at all of these stages to try to test some of those models of succession that we, that we just talked about, the facilitation, inhibition, and tolerance. And what he looked at was, you know, survival, germination, survival, and growth of um, spruce seeds. So he put seeds out in different places and looked at um, germination, survival, and growth in those different locations. So if seed of spruce did arrive out here in this pioneer stage, what happens? Um, so he found that, first of all, there was this aspect of lower germination, and that was consistent across the pioneer stage, the driest stage, and the alder stage. So we have lower germination in those environments. That may simply be, um, that may be a function of uh, some component of the environment that doesn't, doesn't support the germination, or it may, be, um, it may be greater associated with greater seed, seed predation um, as well. So we have in, in both the driest and the alder category, we have higher seed predation and seed mortality. Um, we have lower germination across the board. This may have to do with those differences in, in um, soil, soil moisture conditions, for example. Um, seeds need a sufficient amount of moisture to imbibe and germinate. So we see these negative impacts on spruce in these other environments, um, and those increase as you move from one category to the next. Uh, so we see higher seed predation, lower survival of seedlings in these environments, uh, in the alder and the driest environments, uh, and in the alder environment competition for light. So there's a variety of um, seemingly inhibitory uh, mechanisms that are keeping spruce out of these particular systems, but there are also some positives. So if spruce seedlings did establish, they had higher survival here compared to any of the other categories. There's higher nitrogen levels and higher growth rates in dryas, 
um, and alder environments. Again, we have these nitrogen fixing species that um, make these systems a little bit better than, the, than this one. And then, you know, so, so basically you're able to take a look at all of these different mechanisms and see that in, across the board there were some facilitation mechanisms at play and some inhibition mechanisms at play, all right? Um, so we see evidence of both of those models of facilitation playing out in this system. And obviously these negatives have, have a stronger, um, have, have a strong impact. We don't see spruce establishing in these places, um, but it may also be a seed source issue. But um, anyway, the take home message from this is that we see both positive and negative effects at each within each of these categories on spruce seedlings, suggesting that there's some, some of those facilitation and some of those inhibition processes at play. Okay, our second example comes from a, you know, a place that's, that's near to my heart, um, salt marshes. So salt marshes on the east coast of North America. This is really common for anyone who's spent any time on uh, salt marshes. You, you often see this, you know, um, material deposited on the surface of the salt marsh. So these are tidal environments. You have low tide and you have high tide. This is, this is a picture of this system at low tide. At high tide, this would be covered in water. And the water, of course, is moving from other places. It's carrying debris. You can see some, uh, some lumber there. You can see some driftwood. You can see lots of kind of uh, different organic materials, so different herbaceous material here. And this is referred to as rack. As the tide recedes, that rack settles down on top of the green grass, the, the spartina, and it kills everything, okay? So this is like throwing mulch onto your, on, onto um, plants that you want to grow, that mulch or a tarp, it'll kill them. They, they can't access the light, and so, so everything under there is dead. And so, you know, eventually that rack will get removed in some title, some other title event. And underneath the rack will be bare soil. Um, so, so just mud. And this is a saline environment. So without the plants covering it, that mud becomes much more saline because evapor evaporation from the surface is increased. It's a darker surface. There's no shading. You have greater evaporation. Um, and... So this is, this is a type of, you know, uh, you know, this is a secondary successional process where we have um, regularly have this disturbance that comes through and opens up bare patches, um, bare patches in the salt marsh. And so what happens here is, is there's an early colonizer called Disticlus that comes in, establishes itself, and then that provides, depending on whether you're at the sort of, um, uh, low tide or high tide part of the uh, um, of the system, you'll either have spartina grass. So this is spartina here. Um, it's kind of at the lower tidal por lower portion of the tidal zone, uh, or juncus, which is a a, a rush, which um, tends to occur at the higher tidal higher portion of the tidal zone. Okay, and so D disticlus will establish in any of these places, and was considered to be you know. Um, a pioneering species that helped to facilitate the establishment of these other species. And so uh, Burtness and um, Shumway hypothesized that Disticlus might be, um, might be contributing to the successional pathways that we see in the cell marsh environments. So they did this really cool experiment where they looked at um, patches, they, they looked at patches where you have Spartina and Disticlus, so this is um, in the low intertidal zone, and they looked at places where you have um, uh, Juncus and Disticlus in the middle intertidal zone. And they did this experiment where they um, looked at the target species. So the target was either Spartina or Disticlus. They removed its neighbors. So it, in the case of Disticlus being the target, they removed all of the Spartina from around it. Um, and they, they had a high stress, a high salt stress area. So these are these, um, uh, these bare patches and they had a low salt stress area where they, where they watered, okay? And they added fresh water to the system uh, to alleviate salt stress. 
They did the same thing in the high and the middle intertidal zone with Juncus and Disticlus. Okay, and then, then they looked at the plant cover. So how abundant were these species um, in these experimental treatments? Um, and and what, what they found was that um, in the low intertidal zone where Spartina was present, Disticlus had um, lower plant cover in both low and low and high stress environments, high salt stress environments. So that suggests that, that Spartina is inhibiting the growth of Disticlus. So Disticlus is establishing and then Spartina is inhibiting its further progression. So once, once Spartina establishes, it's able to um, outcompete uh, or inhibit Disticlus and it, remove it from the system effectively, okay? Um, Spartina was not impacted positively or negatively by the presence of Disticlus. In contrast, when we look at Juncus, um, where Disticlus was removed, Juncus did, um, under high salt stress, Juncus did much more poorly. So Disticlus was f facilitating colonization by Juncus, okay? So we have higher plant cover in Juncus when in the blue bars where uh, Disticlus was present, where neighbors were present, and lower plant cover where neighbors were absent. Okay, so under stressful conditions, Disticlus facilitated the establishment of Juncus. Under low salt stress, Juncus didn't rely on Disticlus at all, and instead, Disticlus out, or Juncus outcompeted Disticlus. So Disticlus did much better um, when Juncus was not present than um, when it was when it was present. And so again, this suggests that probably Disticlus helps to facilitate or ameliorate the environment in those um, bare patches under rack for Disticlus at this mid-tidal, um, mid-intertidal zone. But once that salt stress is alleviated, once we have more plant cover, Juncus no longer requires Disticlus and now starts to outcompete it. So it's a situation where you have facilitation early on followed by inhibition later on in the successional sequence. Okay, so another example where we have multiple models of succession playing um, at play. Okay, um, the third example is primary succession in rocky intertidal communities. And so this is, this is an example where we have um, rocks in the intertidal community that wave action can, can flip. So we've got these algae, we've got a red algae, uh, Gigartina and a green algae, uh, Ulva lactusa, and they both they both grow on these 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 rocks in the intertidal zone. Um, but when wave action is strong enough, it can flip those rocks, and then you know the the poor algae end up down in the dirt, and you have a bare rock surface for colonization. Okay, so what happens initially? The the sort of sequence of successional processes is that um, very early on you have the establishment of ulva, so this green algae. And then that green algae has established and you know about you know about a year later we start to see the establishment of gigartina, which is the red algae. And then you have this situation where ulva, the green algae, um, declines in prevalence and gigartina, the red algae increases in prevalence. And if you were just to look at that and interpret that graph, you would expect that well, Ulva is modifying the environment somehow, facilitating the establishment of Gigartina, which then outcompetes Ulva, and Ulva is no longer able to um, stay in the system. That would probably be your first interpretation of this. But um, these researchers study, who studied this system, um, Sousa et al., took a look at they experimentally modified, manipulated the um, algal communities. And what they found was that when Ulva was present, it actually actively inhibited Gigartina. When it was removed, Gigartina did very, very well. So this is Gigartina recruits per 25 cent centimeters squared. Um, and we can see that when, when you remove Ulva from the system, Gigartina recruitment increases quite a lot. When Ulva is there, it inhibits Gigartina recruitment. 
And so what they found actually is at play. So why do we see this pattern then? Why does Gigartina eventually take over from Ulva? And the, the explanation is a, an additional biotic stress. So you have these different uh, invertebrates that come and start preferentially munching away at Ulva and removing it from, from the boulders, allowing Gigartina recruitment to occur. Um, and uh, this, this sort of switchover to happen. Okay, so in that case, we have an example of active um, inhibition, but then that inhibition is alleviated because of changes in the biotic um, environment that, that remove, that make this no longer a, a, an ideal spot for ulva to, to occur. Okay, so it's lost from the system and then you know, reestablishes itself on a, on a new rock face. Now, the last piece of this is this idea of alternate stable states. So, you know, what if the trajectory of succession is not set in stone? So we talked about this at the start of the lecture, the idea of a climax community and that, you know, we, we know that there's not necessarily a single endpoint for many um, communities. And so, so a climax, climax community is a little bit of a, a, a misnomer in some ways. One thing that has become increasingly um, relevant given changes in, um, changes in stresses, changes in disturbance that we're seeing globally in response to climate change and various other anthropogenic impacts on the planet is, an, is a, a renewed interest in alternate, the idea of alternate stable states and sort of resilience in communities. And this is not a new idea. Um, uh, Buzz Halling, way back in 1973, coined the term resilience, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So these are not, not new ideas, um, but we're seeing a resurgence of, of study of this particular topic because um, the frequency, the intensity of disturbances is accelerating in response to climate change. So, and, and different, uh, and, and other human stressors. So alternate stable state are cases where different communities develop in the same area under similar environmental conditions. Okay, so you can have two, you know, two or more different endpoints of a particular, um, successional endpoints in a particular area, but otherwise it's very, very similar. An important term here is the idea of stability. So this is when a community remains in or returns to the original structure and function after some perturbation. So you have a disturbance that, um, that, that, hits the system and that system is either able to stay in its current state, refer to that as resistance, it's able to absorb that disturbance, absorb that perturbation and not change, or it's able to absorb that perturbation, respond to it and recover to its original state. And we refer to this as resilience. And this is the, the term that, that Buzz Holling um, coined. Then finally, hysteresis is an inability to shift back to the original community type even when the original conditions are restored. Okay, so that's what this, this diagram shows us. So we often think about communities um, as um, in these, you know, multiple landscapes. So what, what this is showing us is, you know, let's say this is, you know, your community of interest. Let's say it's a, you know, a black spruce forest, just because I like black spruce forests. Now, an alternate stable state so um, this is showing us, you can imagine a marble in a, in a trough like that. If you push the marble up, it's gonna roll back down, okay? So we think of this as um, basically as, a, as, as areas of attraction, okay? And in ecology, this would be, this, this trough here would be the community, the black spruce forest, let's say. Um, these, these slopes would be um, different successional points where you push that system. Maybe you, you disturb it with fire, for example, and you push that system and then it rolls back down, like it returns to its original, it's resilient, it returns to its original state um, pre-disturbance. But there's alternate types of forests that could be there. There can be poplar forests, there can be pine forests. These are alternate end endpoints, alternate stable states. Um, and so if you push that um, system hard enough, if your disturbance becomes larger, or if this landscape is modified so that it becomes easier to push this up and out and over, then all of a sudden your ecosystem, your, your community drops into some new stable place, all right? 
And it may be very, very hard to get that back out from here to, to get it to go back to where it was, all right? So we have a change in some factor, and this can be the, the strength of the disturbance, the intensity, the frequency, whatever it happens to be, or it can be the susceptibility of the system to that disturbance, the vulnerability of the system to that disturbance because it's already compromised by warmer, drier conditions, for example. And so in this situation, we have you know, our, our, our community dropping into some new stable state and it takes a lot of, a lot of change to put it back into the old stable state, if that's even possible. And if it's not possible, this is what we refer to as hysteresis. So a reversal of that change may not result in a return to the original conditions if the initial shift was sufficiently large. Okay, and I'm going to give you two examples. It's kind of hard to conceptualize this. I'm going to give you two examples to sort of think about this. One of them is this black spruce example I was just talking about. So in systems that I work in that are dominated by black spruce, black spruce has been self-replacing on the landscape for thousands of years. So a fire will burn through. Black spruce has serotonous cones. So the fire heats up the wax on the outside of the cones. The cones slowly open, release their seed onto the newly burned seed bed, and black spruce replaces itself. This has been the cycle that has, has happened for, um, for a very long period of time. You have some low severity fire that um, burns through the stand, kills most individuals, but those seeds open, release on the seed bed, and you return to a black spruce state. This requires thick, or, thick organic soil, black spruce like those environments, um, and, and supports different ecosystem functions, okay? So this is where we have black spruce dominating the system. And this has been most of boreal North America for millennia. Now, and so this is, you know, when we think about this, the fire would push that marble up to here maybe. So up to here, the marble returns back via secondary successional processes, okay? Now, we now have a combination of climate warming, which is leading to um, uh, drier conditions in the landscape, which promotes more severe burning, so deeper burning into this thick organic soil. It also promotes um, some deeper burning and more frequent fires, okay? So this, the staying within this particular stable state requires sort of these low severity, fairly infrequent fires. Now we're leading to, now climate change is, is resulting in more severe fires that burn more frequently. And it's, it has pushed many of these black spruce forests up and over this hump and down into a new stable state, which is deciduous dominated, so typically aspen or birch. Um, and where we see this hysteresis happening is if you continue on this low severity, infrequent fire regime, you'll maintain deciduous cover simply because um, you know it takes a hundred years or so before deciduous trees start to die out and you might have spruce recruiting underneath them. So if you continue to have that kind of hundred year fire cycle that goes through and burns those those aspen, these aspens sucker after, um, after fire and they'll replace themselves quite rapidly. So in order to push this back to this, we need a very long fire free interval which is you know, not, not what we have seen in a very long time in these systems. We tend to have sort of lower severity, kind of moderate frequency fires. Um, so you really need to change that, um, change this landscape quite a lot in order to go from this deciduous dominated back to spruce dominated. Okay, so this is an example of, you know, two alternate stable states in boreal forests and a mechanism that pushes this dominant, this dominant stable state up and into this new stable state. Another example for those of you who are more animal oriented comes from the East Coast, um, the North Atlantic where cod fisheries have historically supported the economy. Cod were just incredibly prolific in the oceans for a very long period of time in that region. Um, and we fished them really hard. So we have you know, um, lots of fishing happening. So this is um, the solid line is in catch per tons. The dashed line is in biomass and thousands of tons. Uh, and um, 
what we see is that there was a you know moderate level of fishing back in the 20s and 30s and then we had the invention of technologies that allowed us to find schools of fish in the ocean and this allowed our fishing intensity our catch per unit effort so to speak to increase and our catch really increased in response to those uh, sonar technologies okay so we had this really really high level of fishing through you know uh, post-war right through to the 70s and then we see this massive crash in our catch, our fish catch in, in the cod fishery. And this was associated with a collapse in, in the cod population represented by biomass in thousands of tons. So um, overfishing led to a crash in the cod population. In 1994, I believe there was a moratorium put on cod fishing. Anyone on the East Coast, I guess you are, none of you are old enough to remember that, but when I was a kid, that was a really big deal. A lot of people's livelihoods were really severely impacted by this. Um, and so, so fishing was stopped, but we have still not seen a recovery of the cod stocks. We don't have the same size fish, we don't have the same biomass of fish in the oceans. And this is one place where, where scientists think that we actually have, you know, alternate stable states that are represented um, by this system. So in the early days, cod was really dominant, dominant and it, it, it predated both of these smaller fish, herring and sprat, um, in these systems. And then cod was knocked down, herring and sprat populations were able to increase because there was no longer this predation pressure. Um, and even once the, the system was returned, even once this, this massive fishing pressure was reduced through the moratorium, a change in the system had occurred. There was so much more herring and sprat, which predate cod eggs. So even though there was no longer the fishing pressure, because of this predation of the juvenile forms of cod, the, the eggs that are necessary to produce cod, um, because of heavy predation by the larger populations of herring and sprat, it seems to be keeping the population of cod low. And so the ocean system has entered this alternate stable state that is dominated by herring and sprat rather than cod. And this is all driven by, you know, the fact that there's this, you know, sprat and herring predate cod eggs. When cod was really prolific, its predation on juvenile herring and, and on sprat was sufficient enough to keep their numbers low so they didn't have a really negative impact on the cod eggs. Once the cod population dropped, these populations exploded and were able to, are able to keep the cod population low. So another example of you know, an alternate stable state, and even though the fishing pressures have been reduced, even though we returned the system to what it was in these days, it's the system has entered a state of hysteresis where it can't get back up and over and into a s state where cod becomes the dominant fish species. Okay, so why is this all important? Well, as I as I alluded to earlier, we're seeing a, a, you know big shifts in disturbance regimes associated with climate change, with climate warming, with various aspects of global change. Um, and this is just one example taken from a nice article if you're really interested in, in forests and forest disturbances. This is a really, really neat article in Nature um, where they did a literature review and looked at, looked at changes in different forest disturbance, um, different forest disturbances. And there's lots of pathogens, fire, drought, wind, snow and ice, and insects. And these are all important disturbance agents that can, that can drive changes in communities. And what they found is that in all cases, so what these, each of these diagrams is showing us is direct effects of climate on that disturbance, indirect effects of climate on that disturbance, and, and then interaction effects. And so let's just focus on this direct effect of climate on, on the disturbance. And for almost all of these disturbance agents, we see that this middle black arrow that climate conditions are really central in determining that the, the, the intensity and the frequency of those disturbances. 76% of um, variant, variation in pathogen damage is explained by, by climate alone. 64% of fi in fire, and we know that fi wildfires are increasing on the landscape in response to the warming, drying climate, right? 72% um, in the case of drought. So all of these forest disturbances are really strongly mediated by the climate and the climate is changing. And as a consequence, disturbance regimes are changing with big implications for community change, 
And for the kinds of alternate stable states that we saw in the preceding, in the preceding slides that can lead to really big changes in ecosystem function. Okay, and with that, I'll say farewell. Our next lecture is on ecosystems and I will be posting that in the next day or two. Okay, take care. Mm -hmm.